Hi, this is Dr. Jim Smith, Associate Pastor at La Jolla Christian Fellowship. Welcome back or welcome for the first time, or wherever you are, as you're uh, viewing this particular video as part of our series of Threefold Spring Blessings. It's a six, uh, six week series here, and we're looking at some of the outstanding threes uh, in the Bible. Uh, again, I appreciate the warm response that numbers of you have fed back in my direction, whether through emails or phone calls or just by viewing. And uh, this is a reminder of some of the threes we've already looked at. Uh, we looked at the threefold strand, the threefold cord that is not easily broken. Ecclesiastes chapter four, uh, two is better than one. It's lovely to have right companionship and of course our eternal companion is god himself but we made in his image are also made for each other and so that sense of uh, companionship and the threefold cord uh, is a beautiful reality I've seen a good number of occurrences of that during these unusual weeks here that we're living through we looked at the threefold gift of the magi of the wise ones who came to honor our Lord Jesus, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we came to the point where we recited a familiar verse. Uh, what shall I give him? What can we give the Lord? Well, time, talent, and treasure. There's another three. But also, as the poem goes, I will give him my heart. What a wonderful invitation. Several of you said that all over again. Uh, warm your hearts to turn affections uh, toward the Lord himself. Uh, we looked also at threefold salvation through Jesus, who is in John 14, the way, the truth, and the life. And that answers some of the deepest desires and motivations that we have as human beings. A desire to find a pathway ahead, a desire to know something that uh, is true and authentic and we can build on, and something that is indeed truly alive, not just getting up and walking around every day. And so with that, Jesus says, come to me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What a beautiful dimensions uh, to salvation. And then last time we talked about the three qualities that last forever. Uh, the three things in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, faith, hope, and love. Uh, faith in, hope that, and love for is one way to state it. And the fullness of that being something that by God's grace we can experience. Now today we're going to return to the Old Testament, and that's what this headgear is about. I'll mention uh, more about that in just a moment. But uh, the headgear uh, represents most deeply a sense of humility. This is a symbol across centuries where in the covering of the head, there has been a sign, as well as in the bowing of a person, a sign of humility in the presence of another. And uh, we're wearing that because today's passage, going back to uh, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, so what does the Lord require of you? What does he really want? The Old Testament prophet could ask. And the answer, to do justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Justice, mercy, humility as key signs that are a fulfillment of God's pathway of life and virtue for us uh, to be about citizenry in his kingdom. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, thank you for those who are just joining us uh, anew, for those who are continuing, and all of us, each of us together, look to you. Your word, as we've said before, is a lamp unto our feet, shows us where we stand, where we're at, reveals to us that true place. And it's a light uh, to our feet. It shows us where we ought to be going. A lamp to our feet, a light to our path as we go ahead. And so, Lord, help us as we pursue that uh, truth, that passage from Psalm 119, that we might be walking in your ways. And even when we stand, that we might stand in your ways and stand upon the truth of your word, filled with the life of your spirit. We pray this for each one of us here as we gather and more too that we're touching with our lives. We ask this for your sake 
And in your name, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, how good it is to be with you today. And uh, we look at Micah chapter 6, uh, verse 8, that sense of what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Now, there's more to that passage, of course. Uh, would, it says in verse 7, would Adonai, one of the great words for the powerful God, would Adonai take delight in thousands of rams, ten thousands of rivers of olive oil? I could give my firstborn to pay for my crimes, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. I could turn it all over. But the response comes back, what does the Lord really require? These are things of the heart. These are things that are not just about outward performance or regulation, but about inward dynamic resulting in a blossoming of the graces of God. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. So with that, there is a beauty in this passage that points us uh, toward the, the deep places of God's own perfections, his own character and what he desires in us. So let's take several different steps as we always do here. Uh, first of all, let's look at the uh, issues of the Hebrew words themselves that lie behind these three terms. What does the Lord require of you? What does he really want as characteristics of our life? Number one, mitzpat, M-I-Z-P-A-T. If you're taking notes, that's the Hebrew word, M-I-Z-P-A-T, mitzpat. And mitzpat is a just way. It's a way of fairness. It's a way of equity. It's a way of judging and rendering rightly. And so with this sort of equity, this sort of fairness, this sort of justice, what does the Lord require, number one, to see and admit things as they really are? And in the midst of that, keeping in mind God's mission for the individual, for us, for you and me, to also have a vision of how things ought to be. That is, situations corrected or completed by uh, acts and attitudes that accompany justice, equity, fairness. And so in that, we find a uh, tremendous opportunity we are to be people of justice. We'll come back to this. Secondly, uh, to be people of mercy. And the word, the Hebrew word there is chesed. C-H-E-S-E-D. Chesed. It is a word that often means a covenant love that's revealed in an act of mercy. This is often what is uh, utilized in the Hebrew text picked up on by our Lord himself in talking about the longing of God's heart to affect in our lives a mercy that is possible as only the first step in the accomplishing of radiance of love. That is, mercy is the act that accompanies uh, the loving attitude. And so with that, to uh, do justice meets pot to love mercy, the chesed of God, to cherish that. And then finally, to walk humbly with our God. And that word, sana, T-S-A-N-A. -A. To walk in humility with our God. Uh, to walk in a way that finds us uh, as people who are, as the word humus suggests, in a different language, Latin, People who are down to earth, people who have our feet on the ground, people who are not inflatables and floating around as sort of uh, objects full of pride and of arrogance and of ambition only, but people with feet on the ground, people who are down to earth, people who know their proper place and the proper place of one who would follow the Lord as a place of humility. And may I say without going further, the most compelling example of that is the story of our Lord Jesus himself. 
They're depicted in the Gospels in his incredible patience during three years of ministry, let alone his patience in beginning that ministry 30 years after his birth, and no doubt helping care for his family. As ancient traditions say that Joseph died as an older man at a fairly, uh, fairly early point in Jesus' life, and then he is the oldest son, uh, supplies for everyone else in the family, notably his mother Mary. But humility, uh, and Philippians gives the bigger picture, chapter 2. Being the form of God, he did not think that equality with God was something to cling to, but emptied, poured out himself. Taking the form of man, humbled himself, and was obedient to death, even the death on the cross. That's humility. Down to the earth, literally, he came from heavenly places, in, can we say it again, downward mobility. So to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. What does the law require? The prophet Micah could speak it as the word of the Lord. Now, some people have put uh, various labels on each of these characteristics, and maybe that's the second stop off here uh, after the Hebrew words themselves in the definition. Uh, some have said, well, you know, this is, uh, this is like justice is the perspiration uh, and the, uh, the mercy uh, is more the affection and the humility is more the inspiration as one comes to a place of humility and then sees things as they are, and looks up to the one who is and uh, becomes a servant becomes an obedient servant in humility. Um, there's all kinds of words we can attach that describe these attributes. Uh, but one of the questions we can ask here in, in this second moment is, which way do the arrows point? What does that mean? Well, it means, for example, uh, does justice a demand for justice, a requirement of justice, the expectation of fairness and equity then lead us to show mercy. Acts in which we come to help, to assist, to feel not only a, a sympathy, but an empathy, not only a deep feeling along with the person, but actively identifying with their need, as Jesus did with ours, of course. The word became flesh, dwelt among us. So is it that justice then feeds the mercy, and the mercy then uh, leads us, whoever the object of that mercy is, to find a humility, a place where we come alongside them uh, and find uh, their situation to be one that's not beneath us, but uh, alongside us? Does the arrow point that way? Justice leads to an attitude of mercy and then an act of humility, or does it start the other way? Do we begin with humility, with this kind of bowing down to the Lord, covering our heads in this ancient symbol, in a sign of being at the direction of another? Uh, and then in that, we show immediately that we're uh, exposed to acts of mercy, acts of ours, but also sharing those with other people as we have mutual needs. And in that, we find justice fulfilled. Let me say simply that I believe the arrows can go either way. One of the great things about our gracious Lord is that he can meet us at any spot in life and show us best next steps. Yeah, best next steps. So whether it begins in justice, shown in mercy and uh, moving out as we uh, come alongside others in humility, or, or it comes back the other way with an attitude and uh, then a, a deeper compassion, which comes out in acts of justice. The Lord will show us, but he meets us where we are. And how wonderful that is today, wherever you are, whatever your situation, God can lead you forward in these best next steps that are in sync with his word, his way, his life for us. Now we might ask in the third place here, are there examples that come to mind? Many of you know that I teach church history. And so pardon me if I go into a special 
uh, respect for Psalm 101, verse 6, where the psalmist, who'd seen everything, said, My eyes will be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. The one who would walk righteously, talk about walking humbly with God, the one who would walk righteously will be my companion, will be my counselor. My eyes will be on the faithful of the land. So who are some of the faithful of the land? Well, let me reach back for a moment, if I may. If we need a little inspiration, and one of the signs that my grandma talked to me about was, just when I think I'm having a tough time, I should look at someone else. I've told that story before. If you want to hear it again, get in touch with me, one way or another, jds31 at cox.net, if you'd like. In that, I should look at the situation of the other. And so with that in mind, how is it that we find illustrations in history of justice, mercy, and humility? Let me make a few suggestions that inspire us to see with perspective where we are and to see that no moment is too difficult for us to find a pathway which is God's pathway forward. Uh, in terms of doing justice, uh, I can't think of anyone better than Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, what an amazing prophetic ministry, and it's been a joy to me for those who begin uh, often respecting never a faultless person, never claimed it, but someone who deeply was committed to a path of justice. Uh, in that, to find also that he is a minister, a pastor, the one who declares Christ is Lord, and found his strength, his power, his perseverance, even leading to him becoming many would say a martyr there in 1968. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, to do justice. What a remarkable legacy that is. Uh, one of my teachers, Henry Nowen, whom I've mentioned before, a uh, Catholic spiritual writer, uh, marched with Dr. King on the, uh, the way to Selma, Alabama. I would never forget that and the importance of justice. What about mercy? How about Mother Teresa and her ministry to, uh, to incredible numbers of people, in some ways rooted in her life in, in India, but then coming across the nations overseas uh, and internationally to love mercy. Uh, what a remarkable individual. Some of the quotes that she leaves us with, not uh, unlike Dr. King, are words of wisdom to live by. You want another example, William and Catherine Booth, the founders of the Salvation Army, raised in very different social situations. He in awful poverty in London, and she more of an upper class individual, well-educated, and yet each of them had a heart of mercy uh, for those who were in need. They loved mercy. And so in that, they uh, moved to identify uh, with all manner of different people, as our Lord himself uh, stretched in ways we see uh, in the Gospels. And find today, as he's our great high priest, and stretches to embrace us and make intercession for us in our time of need. To do justice, maybe Dr. King. Uh, to love mercy, perhaps Mother Teresa or William and Catherine Booth, founders of the Salvation Army. To walk humbly with our God. Now, someone in history there, several years ago, we were over in the Hawaiian Islands, and we visited Molokai, and there was the ministry, the legacy of Father Damien, uh, who there went in a time when leprosy was one of the most feared plagues around. And as a frontline worker, may I say it that way, honoring those who today are in the front lines. A frontline worker, Father Damien goes, and uh, without anything he believed could protect him from uh, that sign of leprosy, eventually he dies of the disease. But there in Molokai, what humility, what an amazing life to be lived. Those are people in the past. Now, I don't know if individuals that, uh, that uh, you have met over the years have come together in what for me is called the cross paths list. These are people to me that I've met, or I heard them speak live, or in concert live, or some situation like that, sometimes face-to-face, -face, 
uh, other times uh, at a distance, but there in person, uh, there was communication. Maybe it was a personal note or a letter or some such. Uh, who do I think of there? Well, one of them uh, is I think of. To do justice, I think of my brother Ed. Uh, some of you back when uh, we were a much smaller church and we were just kind of getting started and taking a deep breath in this new chapter of what God had. You met my brother Ed. He's since graduated and is in heavenly places. Uh, one of my delights will be to see him again, by God's grace. Uh, and so my brother Ed, to do justice, he was an attorney who used that uh, legal practice oftentimes uh, to plead causes that were in the interest of justice. Uh, he worked, for example, with Cesar Chavez and the farm workers to try and find more just conditions for them. And he and I had long conversations about what it means to do justice, whether with down and outers or up and outers or just out and arounders, uh, whatever the group, there is a way that is just and brings persons uh, back into a place of life and supply. My brother Ed, I think of him today. Uh, what about others that I met? Well, at Harvard one time, when I was a doctoral student there, I got to hear Bishop Desmond Tutu to love mercy, and he spoke about how the motivation of his life was an outpouring of heart for his people, his African people, various tribes, uh, but also, as it says in the wisdom literature in the Old Testament, even the oppressor could find no comfort. Because comfort doesn't come from being a better oppressor. It comes from coming home to the Lord and being coforte, comfort, strong together, in the presence of the one who is always our strength, and that is the Lord himself. And so Bishop Tutu, memorable talk there at Harvard's Memorial Chapel, Harvard Church. Uh, wonderful opportunity there to love mercy and humility. Some years ago at the church I grew up in, College Avenue Church, had the privilege of hearing uh, Reverend Richard, Richard Wurmbrand there, the one who would be uh, the founder of a group called the Voice of the Martyrs, those who had been killed uh, underneath Soviet occupation and the uh, Soviet bloc countries. He spent 14 years in an underground cell, 14 years in an underground cell going nowhere and faced despair and said, Lord, what would you do? I bow before you uh, and your purposes. I know you are not the motivation for the oppressors, but in this oppression, you have a way for me. And he began to knock on the walls of his cell in Morse code, messages to people in the adjoining cells. And across years, he would knock out messages. When all were asleep, he would call out in the best way he could, in a way that would penetrate the walls. And years later, he found people who had come to Christ through that witness. Humility. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And in the right time, in the right way. He will raise you, lift you, strengthen you, and bring you up. What a wonderful promise. I cite these examples with uh, great privilege uh, to be in the company of these who've known our Lord and celebrated him and sought to follow him by doing justice and loving mercy and walk humbly in his presence. Now we might say as we turn the corner toward the latter part of this lesson, uh, what about other signs of humility? Well, we are coming up on, uh, on Memorial Day. And this uh, kerchief I have on my head, yes, I'm wearing headgear once again. And several of you might say, are you trying to look like an ancient Israelite? Well, this is closer than usual. The beard gets me partway there. Uh, and this might affect other aspects of it. Again, across cultures, covering of the head as well as bowing is seen often as a sign of humility. But I'm wearing this today because this is the kerchief that belonged to my great grandfather, Sam Rand. Sam Rand fought in the first Minnesota sharpshooters at Gettysburg. And that was the summer in which the Emancipation Proclamation came out. What it was to do justice in a land where 
untold numbers of people lived in slavery. Well, in his mind, it was to fight for their freedom. And he said after the proclamation, as the oral history has come down to us, there was an even greater purpose than duty. There was a sense of justice that he was fighting for. And there at the field at Gettysburg and later on, there was that deep sense of contending for the freedom of a people. And we thank God for the gift of freedom. It isn't free. So I wear this to honor uh, a Memorial Day. That's the beginnings of Memorial Day after the Civil War. Those who had died in battle, he didn't. Uh, but three of my great grandfathers fought in the Civil War. And, uh, two of them died fairly young. And so uh, with that, uh, there's a remembrance that uh, there are good examples out there, justice and mercy and uh, humility. They're even in the trenches of life. In any case, we come to the New Testament here. And uh, it's interesting to note that Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require? To do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. That is quoted nowhere in the New Testament. Why? Should I be bothered by that? Does the New Testament short circuit the Old Testament? No, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill it. And so he did. He fulfilled it there by his work on the cross, all the satisfaction of the requirements of the law, which as we violated them, and I confess uh, here on this day, I'm a recovering sinner. That's not my boast, that's my burden. A recovering sinner. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow, as the old hymn goes. So Micah 6, 8 isn't quoted, per se, in the New Testament. But Jesus himself is the fulfillment of the law, the one who is full of justice and mercy and humility, and acts upon that there on the cross, but in the years prior, uh, his teachings. His teachings focus us back on the God before whom uh, we humble ourselves. It is not God's delight to beat us down. It is God's delight to find us in our proper place as his daughters and sons by faith and to lift us up. And so with that, Jesus could say, let me summarize what the law says. Matthew 22 talks about this. To love the Lord your God. Again, we say it with your heart's affections, your soul's exertions, your mind's reflections, and all the strength that you have. And then, in that place of humility, that place of mercy, that place seeking justice for others, to love your neighbor as yourself. The great commandment underlined by Jesus, fulfilled by Jesus, stand before us today. How grateful we are as we come to his word and find that Jesus paid it. We just mentioned uh, in reference to my great grandfather, Sam Rand, who fought at Gettysburg in part uh, for a cause that would set free multitudes of those who'd lived in slavery, justice mercy, and a humility there in life's trenches. I want to mention another day, often bypassed by the church. Uh, many of you will be seeing this on the day in which it's posted, which is a Wednesday. That was our usual face-to-face uh, -face Bible study day for uh, of the years since I came uh, to uh, La Jolla Christian Fellowship, uh, seven years ago now. And in that, uh, there is a sense of gratitude I have for those of you who are continued and newcomers and, and so forth. Uh, but it's also the case that uh, you realize I bring up aspects that sometimes are overlooked. And this one is tomorrow, 40 days after Easter, the church recognizes Ascension Day. He arose. 
and not just from the grave. He rose and was caught up into heavenly places. Recorded by Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 16, Luke's Gospel, Luke 24, that Jesus, 40 days after uh, his resurrection, was lifted up into heavenly places, and there he lives to make intercession for us. And he awaits us there in the Father's house. It has many mansions. So we are so grateful uh, for that. We honor the ascension. And so for those of us who are feeling like, boy, maybe the parade's passed us by in these days, uh, we're feeling a sense of loss of one dimension or another. Think of what the disciples felt there at the ascension of Jesus when Jesus uh, is lifted up and he's gone. He's gone. You'll never see him again. What a sense of loss. What a moment. And could they have let that be something that dominated their lives? Yes. But they didn't. Mark's gospel tells us that they went forward uh, from that place uh, in sharing their faith and in offering signs of God's presence, the miraculous that was part of their life, sharing and in signs. Luke's gospel tells us that above the clouds as Jesus ascended, looking at each other and saying, boy, we can live the loss, or we can say, we believe the promise. We believe that he said, I'm with you always. And so they went forth, and with joy, and with celebration, they marked the presence of their Lord. Whatever loss you might be feeling these days, think of those disciples when Jesus said, going up, and there he goes. But they have a life to live. And that same Jesus who promised to be with them has promised to be with us day by day. That same Jesus who through the gift of the Holy Spirit abides with us, reveals the fullness of God. That Lord, that Spirit is with us today. We are spirited people even in what could be dispiriting times. So let us be about our Lord's business. Always to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God, to give thanks to our Lord Jesus, who both in his way of life and in his sacrifice has fulfilled the requirements of the law and now calls us to walk by grace in paths that are life-giving and honor the image of God in all manners of people, and so to imitate him. What a great privilege we have. Uh, my grandpa, great-grandpa, showed some of that. Some of the examples we've cited showed aspects of that. But our Lord himself crowns this moment. Whether we think of Memorial Day, whether we think of Ascension Day, or just this as the day the Lord has made. The Lord crowns this with his being the way, the truth, and the life. May God bless us all. Lord, we bow before you in humility. And whatever our exact situation, lead us by your word and spirit to respond to you and take the best next steps that you have for us as we prove to be your disciples. Glory to you, Lord, now and forever at La Jolla Christian Fellowship, whether virtual or face-to-face, -face, whether digital or handshakes or high fives. Lord, whether in the sanctuary or in the larger sanctuary that you've created for us, the sanctus of this creation, Lord, let us be your people. And that'll be awesome. Praise to you now and forever. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for joining us.